Hello, friends. Welcome to episode 134 of Experience Data Talk podcast and video show featuring data science leaders and technologists from around the world. My name is Mike Delgado, and today we're excited to chat with Olivier DeVoe at our Experience Data Labs in Sao Paulo, Brazil, about how they launched COVID Radar, a data project focused on fighting the coronavirus pandemic and help with Brazil's economic recovery. This important data project was launched in less than three weeks, and Experian quickly established partnerships with the United Nations, SAP, Amazon, the University of Sao Paulo, and dozens of others to help mobilize this data and make it useful to organizations working to reduce the spread of COVID-19. Here's our conversation. Olivier, thank you so much for being on Data Talk. Well, thank you for inviting me. Awesome. So um, before we get started, I wanted to find out how are you doing right now amid COVID-19 and what is, what is it like living in Sao Paulo? Um, so it's, I would say it's a, it's a little bit awkward because on one hand, um, we, the, the pandemic is very much active. We, we're going to talk about that but, uh, in a second, but uh, uh, the, the reports varies a lot, but uh, typically we, we still have pretty bad news about the number of people that are uh, victim of the, the, the virus. But in the same time, the, um, I, I think the, both the, 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 the government, the people are, are really fed up with, um, with the, the social distancing, with the, all, all the type of measures. And, uh, and there's a very big pressure from society to get back to a pre, pre-pandemic uh, habit. Uh, and so you see bars in, and restaurants being, uh, being reopened for, for a few weeks now. Uh, there's pressure to extend the opening hours. Uh, you can see that the, the traffic has been uh, quickly coming back to, to not really to pre-pandemic levels, but it's still pretty, pretty dense. Uh, Sao Paulo it used to be absolutely uh, terrible for traffic. Um, so, yeah, it's, a, it, it's mixed feelings because when you look at the numbers, uh, we are at a stage of the, the, the contagion that is much, much worse than when we started the social distancing measures. Um, but in the same time, I believe that for most people, it's, it's they just reach a stage where they, they, they want to forget about it and, and move forward. Uh, so that, that's, a, that's a little bit uh, the, the situation, I would say. So can you explain for those who don't know anything about COVID Radar, what it is, mm-hmm. how it got started, and the work you're doing right now with it? Right. So COVID Radar was, um, we, we, so, so to understand where we started. So we are an innovation unit of a multinational company. Um, the company is about uh, providing uh, data tools and insights. So it's, it's really about analytics, it's about helping people making decisions. And um, when, we, when we monitored um, the first sign of the pandemic in Asia, then in Europe, uh, we knew that this was, that, that was a wave that was going to hit Brazil. Like we we need. Uh, we also knew that, um, and that's something um, lots of people don't understand abroad. It's, Brazil is a is a continent-sized country, so it's 27 states, uh, 5,000 uh, municipalities, wow, um, 200 million people. It's a it's a very big place. Uh, it it it, it, it looks from outside like one big. Uh, entity, but it's not. It's uh, several entities. Um, uh, it's a federal state, so the, the, the local and the state level have lots of autonomy. And uh, and we knew the limitations that that Brazil had typically in terms of uh, access to data. Some of the the municipalities were uh, having much less resources than others. Um, and so when we saw that, we were we're gonna we're gonna suffer a lot from the lack of available data. Um, lots of the the people who are in charge, whether they are working in the public sector, whether, whether they are at companies, are gonna have a lot of difficulties understanding where we are at in the pandemic. Uh, uh, do, do we have uh, what, what is the risk level we are really facing? Um, we also knew that that for researchers, because we by being an innovation uh, unit, and, and work, I mean, uh, we have, for example, uh, Renato Vicente, our chief data scientist, uh, university professor, doing some research. Um, we knew that for researchers, it's very valuable to have access to the the the, the, the right data sets. Um, with the with the work we did before, we knew that um, mobility would be mobility data would be a huge plus 
in understanding the, the not just the, how the, the pandemic progressed in the country, but also how are people reacting to it. Uh, and so we were like, okay, what can we do about it? And, and the easy answer for us was, uh, let's start by fixing the data issue. So let's make sure that we have a, a, a data lake uh, that the researchers, the, the maybe the, the public health workers, the, uh, the, the people who are interested to know about the stage of pandemic um, can look at uh, this data is safe, this data is protected, this data is curated, um, and this data allows you to to have a different look at the, the problem. So not just the, the number of incidences, like the the, the, the victims from the, the, the panic, but also um, social demographic data so that you can start having some deeper analysis, understanding who is more most uh, uh, impacted by the virus. Uh, mobility data to, to, to put all this data in a much more dynamic way so that you can uh, most likely in the future make better models to, to predict the, uh, the progression of a, a disease like that. And so that's that was our, our answer, um, and, and we did that in a very record time. So we, uh, in about three weeks, we had the first version of the of the tool in the air to to make sure that we had a, a first layer of data. Um, to to be very clear, and I think that's that's the really the key message is um, the technical challenge is is great. It's it's a, something we are really proud of. But what we are most proud of is um, to, to mobilize a, a series of companies, a series of institutions around the same projects. Um, and so, because you had like a, you have thousands of volunteers who are actually manually uh, tracking data uh, uh, from, from uh, uh, public um, uh, health secretaries, for example. Um, but then the, the second problem is how do you put this data in a way that it can be uh, processed and, and, and used by, by people to, to have a, a quick dashboard and, and see at, uh, the, the numbers in a, uh, for those who are not uh, data scientists or who, those who are not even statistic, statisticians or, or not used to work with Excel, uh, how, how, do you, how do you process all this data and, and make it available? Uh, and so that, that's what we, we try to do. Um, uh, so the technical, technical, technical issue, uh, getting access to, to data, uh, and then uh, build a coalition so that we can multiply the use case on top of th those data and, and really help uh, the society. And it's amazing how quickly your team responded to be able to, in three weeks, have something to actually work with. Um, so that's amazing. And then I love that you said, like, what you're most proud of also is the ability to bring people together, bring organizations together to like start to work with this data, because that is also huge, not only to, to have these data sets protect them, but also like to get the right organizations involved to like, let's how, how can we make this data useful for insights? Uh, are you allowed to talk about some of the partnerships that you've created? Absolutely. Yeah, so the, the, I mean, it's a, uh, uh, we, we almost lost track because it's, it's probably uh, more now than 60 institutions working wow. together in some sort. Um, but so some of the of the players were really uh, critical because they they brought their own network and so it started to really grow organically. Um, so, for example, through through uh, a personal connection, um, uh, we. So, so a very good friend of mine is uh, is leading the UN Global Compact uh, uh, agency here in Brazil, and that's an agency that has already a network. And so, um, when, when I pitch the idea, I say, "Well, that's absolutely wonderful. Uh, we really want to have a, a positive impact. Or, or associates and our members uh, want to act, but it's it's very hard to know what to do." Uh, you need to remember that in, in March um, of this year, nobody really knew if that was going to be a, a one-month issue. Uh, people were talking about quarantine, like in the, the strict sense of 40 days or something. Uh, we, right. we didn't really know how, how deadly the virus was. Uh, we had some 
we had seen the images of, of, of Italy and Spain, but uh, all that was very unknown. And so uh, when we move into the unknown, it, it creates a lot of anxiety. People start going in different directions. Uh, and, and, and for example, uh, uh, Julian, who is a, a partner at BCG, uh, told rep repeatedly, what we see is a lot of people trying to do the same thing in different places. That's hugely inefficient if you, if you think about it. Um, and so by, by bringing those companies, those partnerships together, we started dividing a little bit the issues. So uh, for us, it was very clear that our mission was focusing on the analytics side. So uh, bringing the data, building the algorithm, uh, making it available for who, who mostly uh, need them, um, build a tool for the public health worker, uh, that something we can discuss about. Um, but there was a huge other need, which was um, hundreds of companies wanted to make donations, but they didn't know where to make donations. Mm. If you think about it, that's that's a little bit, um, by the way, that, that must happen a lot in our world. Like the, we talk about uh, 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 people helping others, but the good, it's not just about, oh, I want to help. It's uh, where do you help? How, mm. Are you sure that what you That's right. is going to the, the right direction? And so uh, the, 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 the company Atos, for example, was really uh, interested about that issue. And, and they start building this marketplace or this, this donation platform where uh, associations could request help, like a, um, uh, basic uh, health kits, uh, sanitation kits, uh, alcohol gel, uh, masks, active equipment, etc. And then companies could offer uh, on the same time. So they were matching this uh, this donation uh, uh, problem. Uh, we have a, a, a Microsoft uh, locally who was very interested to uh, to tackle the, the mental health issues, and, and so they. They work together with a, a series of other partners to to build their their own tool so that people could have uh, uh, very easily access to a, a psychologist and, um, and, and and share their their pain and their, their, their emotional strain on uh, about the pandemic. Um, the um, a special team focus on uh, really big uh, donations or, or let's say big actions. So bringing uh, uh, ventilators, for example, to remote areas. Uh, and so th those sort of auto-organize um, within the, the constellation of the COVID radar uh, coalition, I would say. Fantastic. And I love like the divide and conquer approach uh, mm -hmm. as you were like, OK, let's all work together. Let's not all work in our own silos, because I like the comment from your colleague at BCG about there are too many organizations doing the same thing. Like that's not helpful. So the fact Absolutely. that you're able to like come together, hey, let's divide up the work. We can focus on the analytics. Other organizations can work on other things, but let's all have a central kind of repository for this data and then like work together to be able to help out the different uh, needs, uh, public health needs, healthcare needs. And you, you mentioned um, healthcare workers and mm -hmm. that's obviously the forefront of our minds. Like how can we help the doctors and nurses um, help with vaccines, help with uh, right. mm -hmm. the public getting access to things that they need. Uh, can you talk uh, specifically about that, how Experian was involved? If you, if you look at the, um, the public work, the, the public health worker, uh, th those are the guys on the front line, right? They, they, they see this, um, this tsunami coming. Sometimes, by the way, they don't even know when it's coming. Because remember, we are in a continent, we are not in a country. So it's um, uh, some some areas in March had zero contamination, others had already thousands. And so um, the, the the first thing we want to to bring to them was some. So, that's why the name, by the way, the radar, uh, some sort of of, of uh, visibility of mm -hmm. when is it going to come. So uh, what is the stage of the um, the pandemic in their region in the neighboring region? So that that was really our. Uh, one of the first problems we wanted to tackle, and why that? Because you, you, uh, again, back in in March, April, um, nobody was really ready for that disease. Like, 
So uh, ventilators were missing uh, protective equipment. But in the same time, if you if you if you buy uh, the, the supply of those equipment was also limited. So if, if a region that was not really impacted was buying equipment, it would take it away from another region who actually needed. And so um, we thought um, let's help the not just the, the nurse and the, the doctors, but the guys who are the, the planning guys, like uh, who are responsible for buying the equipments for um, for getting ready the, the or, or, or hiring more staff or, or, or recalling staff, etc. And so that that was one of the first uh, problems we, want, we wanted to fix. And uh, we worked together with the uh, Conazens, which is an um, uh, institution uh, that really focuses on helping the uh, municipality health administrators or, 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 or regions. And so um, they, they, when we asked them, what do you need to know about the pandemic? Like, what are the what are the KPIs you would like to monitor so that you can actually uh, help your your members uh, manage better uh, through the through the pandemic? And they were like, uh, first we need to know who is I mean, how many infected, how many uh, people uh, uh, were victim of the the disease. Uh, second, we need to know um, what is the stage of our of our healthcare capacity in that region. They work by health regions. After that, we sort of have to know, understand a little bit about the mobility of people to see if that's if that's an issue or not. Like if, if um, what we what we wanted to do, and we are not there yet. Uh, uh, probably going to be a second phase. Was really linking the the, the the contagion to the mobility, and so having uh, predictive models about where the, the virus would, would hit next. Um, but mobility was also very relevant to see if people were get, going out of their place, if they they were getting together, because those were poss potential focus of the of the disease. So the, the 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 public sector would like to know in some kind if they were exposed to this kind of a uh, so that's why we, we focused on those three main questions and we produce a, a, a dashboard that actually process uh, that, that answer this question for every region of Brazil. Wow. So that, wow. that's what we, we, we did basically. What, what have you found like that prediction model, which is crucial here to help people determine like medical supplies that are going to be needed in certain areas. What were some of the data points that were important to your team? As far as making those predictions, to be very clear, here, Mike, we, we we were not predicting. We we did not reach that stage yet, um, and we we did some experiments, but we we didn't get there uh, with the, the accuracy we wanted to really uh, feel confident about that. So we we didn't put that in place. Um, that's also because the the I mean every pandemic is different so the, the contagion pattern is different so it, it needs to have its own model and we are still it's a very new virus we were still learning about it um, but uh, what we could already work was uh, not specifically on, on on the model but on some of the elements that will become the model first so the uh, first the incidences like um, uh, having the the seven days uh, average uh, for contagion we worked on uh, uh, what we called an accelerometer um, model, so basically to to see if the disease was accelerating uh, and, and to understand the speed of the disease, because that was already a very good uh, indication. If if you see in in a uh, you, you 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 didn't need to calculate it, you you could leave it to the human because the human is already good at predicting mm -hmm. if that was going to be an issue or not, knowing its own. Uh, region and uh, and then the mobility. Uh, why? Because we knew that uh, if people were really uh, active, uh, there was a very big big chance that the, the the contagion would increase in in the region. Yeah, and I know like here in the states, like Google was trying to develop different ways to even track mobility by hey, you know, install this app on your phone, and if you end up getting it, you can alert us. And but there's a lot of privacy concerns over that. So how yes. have you dealt with like uh, privacy concerns because each region, each country mm -hmm. has their own concerns around how they're going to manage kind of health right. data. We did a bit of work with mobility before, and that that really 
Um, so we, we were not just aware, but very worried about privacy. The, for, I mean, experience, I wouldn't say worry, it's paranoid <laughs> about, about privacy. So it's a, it's a very big thing for the company. Uh, the way we tackled that was, um, uh, first of all, we, we never worked with the identifier. So we uh, worked just with anonymized data. Um, we also aggregated the data, and that, that's one of the value we, we added to the, to the data legacy. Uh, so we, we received mobile data from, from partners. Uh, we aggregate this data in what we would call a, a matrix, origin destination matrix, so that we, we keep some, um, we keep the granularity we need to make those indications about uh, people are leaving their place or not in a determined uh, neighborhood. Um, but in the same time, we don't reveal uh, sensitive information about, about anyone. So um, they, they, they are, the mathematicians have calculated in a, in, in a in statistical terms so that we, we cannot uh, identify people. Uh, in most of the region, Brazil is pretty easy because the, it's very dense. So the, the way we have data, typically it's a, it's a dense area. Um, but so the, the, the way we tackle that was making sure we don't leave any, uh, we don't receive even uh, any in personal identifier. Uh, we aggregate the data and, uh, and then we, researcher can have access to this aggregated data and the public health worker have access to the indicators, which are even more aggregated. So they're, they're, they're indicators on the screen. They don't, they don't have access to directly the, the, the data itself. Uh, That's fantastic. I, I love all the precautions. Um that you're all taking and beautiful to see just how different teams are using the data and using it ethically. So that's beautiful. What, um, before we go, what are kind of the next steps for COVID radar? So we, we know in a phase where, uh, just to remember, uh, all that was pro bono work from, from experience and all the different partners. Um, but it, it's not sustainable. We cannot maintain this, uh, this team working on, on, on this platform. And, and by, by the way, it's not, it's not our vocation to do that. I mean, it's, it's a very cool project. We are very proud of it, uh, but, but we still have uh, other things to do. And so what we are looking at now is uh, um, uh, different scenarios to, um, to preserve the legacy of it, so to make sure that the, the work is, I mean, anything that is useful is going to be used. Um, and, and, but in the same time, it's operated by the, the right person and the, the, the people who are mostly uh, entitled to, to, to operate it. So uh, we are now discussing with a series of partners. Uh, there, are, there are basically two, um, uh, there are two answers we need to, to find. The first one is who is going to pay for it because there, there is a cost associated to that. Uh, and by the way, we don't want this to be to fall to drop off the floor because to drop on the floor because of uh, of a resource issue, and then there's a question of who is going to operate it, who is the best, what is the best home for that uh, for that project, um, and to to help with those two questions, uh, we bring a series of other questions, which is th there are there are mainly two directions you can take. One is um, you go deeper into the health. Um, use cases, and so it would be very easy um, to add other contagious diseases like uh, Zika, Dengue, uh, Chikungunya. Uh, by the way, the approach is, by definition, it's a global approach, so we, we could expand geographically also the, the coverage, so that's something we are, we are talking um, with, with the health organizations. Um, another another direction that we are looking at is why does that not become an um, ESG platform? So why don't we go wider with the range of social issues that we can tackle with the with the data lake? Because if you look at uh, uh, the, the environmental, social, and governance issue, it's uh, fundamentally it's about uh, being able to to uh, process a series of different data sets. Here we worked a lot with the health one, and we worked a lot with the social demographic one, so uh, financial inclusion, uh, the, the impact of 
COVID on the, the revenue of households, etc. Those are data that we have at Explain that we can um, make available. Uh, if we add the education piece, uh, we could start having the human development index, for example, from, from the platform. Those can be calculated also. So that's something we are, we are discussing with some of the United Nations agencies. Uh, why don't we use the platform to help you with other social uh, use cases? Uh, so it's, 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 it's a little bit of a um, uh, multiple scenario that we are evaluating at the moment, um, pledging for, for uh, social investors to, to, um, to support the, 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 the platform and then, uh, and then uh, evaluating with the potential operators who would be able to, to take it uh, to a new home, let's say. Uh, for those listening in that might want to be involved in some way to help out either through donations or maybe even being a data partner, what what suggestions do you have for them on how they can get involved? So the, the, um, uh, just drop an email. Like uh, we, we, we schedule a call. We discuss the options. Uh, we, we've had – it's funny because I, I work primarily in, in business development, and uh, I had more meetings – in the pandemic than before, just to give you an Pandemic and, and social distancing does not mean that you, uh, you cannot meet and, and talk about exciting projects. So that, that's uh, something uh, it, that is very clear. Uh, but uh, we are very open to new ideas, to, to new use cases. Um, we, we believe that we, uh, we did something that is very valuable for society and we really want to uh, not preserve for the sake of preserving it, but we want to maximize the, the benefits that it can generate. And so any ideas that, that, is, uh, that can potentialize uh, this dream, uh, we are ready to discuss it. Fantastic. And Olivier, what's the best way for people to get in contact with you? Uh, I would say uh, it's globally probably by email or, or uh, WhatsApp notes or something, uh, I, I, can, I can share those, those details. Okay, wonderful. And I'll put that all on the blog and also link to your LinkedIn profile so people can message Perfect. you there as well. Excellent. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for being on Data Talk, Olivier. Well, thank you, Mike. It was a very, very exciting discussion. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Data Talk podcast. We share new shows every week, and you can find the full catalog of previous episodes, including YouTube videos, on our Experian News blog. You can get access to the full catalog by going to experian.com slash data talk. And we always love hearing from our community. So if you have any comments or suggestions for future shows or guests you'd like to hear from, please let us know. You can leave a comment on iTunes or you can reach out to us on Twitter at Experian Data Lab. You can also email me directly. My email is michael.delgado at experian.com. Take care and we'll chat next week.